Good afternoon and welcome back to the weekly market analysis for the week ending January 19th, 2024. Uh, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. You can also find my insights on Twitter at Mr. J. Thomason. You can follow my weekly newsletter at BeFinanciallyFree.Substack.com. Uh, in 2024, I am uh, releasing uh, the uh, contents of the newsletter entirely free for all subscribers. You just have to subscribe. Uh, so please go ahead and do that. Uh, if you're interested, the links to both of those are in the description of the video that you see below. And uh, so today, uh, markets have broken out. Obviously, I'm looking at the futures, uh, so things are a little bit different on the futures, but if you just put in SPX, uh, then you can actually see right here we have uh, broken not only the uh, all-time closing high, but if I just adjust this line a tad, uh, we also have broken the intraday all-time highs. Uh, and closed at 48.39 and 82 cents on SPX. Um, so obviously, like I said, I look at the futures, um, but still a breakout on that nonetheless. Um, a lot of things going on technically. You see a lot of lines on the chart, uh, and I'm going to try to explain kind of uh, what I'm thinking here on that just shortly. Uh, but uh, definitely had much more of a, a bearish. Uh, tone last week. I'm, I'm glad to say that that was wrong. Uh, definitely actually in my most recent newsletter, which uh, was posted, uh, one of the things that I put was that over the next week, the likely direction for risk assets was uncertain with an upside bias. So uh, a lot of times what, what you see in my videos is kind of my gut reactions uh, to the week and kind of just things that I've been watching based on what I'm seeing. Uh, but definitely over the weekend, my research process, which I outline all throughout this newsletter, um, I kind of summarize with my reasons to be bullish over the next week and then my reasons to be bearish uh, over the next week. And one of the things that I had been worried about that you heard me talk about last week was that dovish PPI came out on Friday and equities did not respond in a favorable way like equities, or I'm sorry, uh, like bonds and gold did. So. Uh, taking a look uh, on the S&P chart here on the futures, sorry about that. Uh, that day was uh, right here. Uh, if I zoom in on that candle, um, uh, my crosshairs are kind of right over it. That little green, uh, that little green shoot right there. Uh, it was a little worrisome because we were at overhead resistance uh, for the uh, yearly high uh, that was set. Well, last year's yearly high, which was at the end of 2023. Uh, we, it looked like we were getting rejected off of it a second time, uh, and we got no, uh, we didn't get a huge bid up in the market on, in equities uh, like we did. Like if we go to the uh, to the bond market, we'll, this will be the inverse. Uh, but on Friday last week, um, bonds did fall uh, precipitously. Uh, obviously, we got uh, you know over two basis points drop on the ten year. Um, Maybe another way to look at it would be to look at the bond futures. So if I go to the 10-year futures chart uh, on Friday, you actually saw it close up uh, pretty strongly. Obviously, in the last week, bonds have been down. That's really interesting. We'll talk about that uh, maybe in just a little bit. But again, just suffice to say, I was a little concerned uh, on the upside because of, uh, because of that close right and then if you go to the gold chart which i will do that right now uh gold also had a really big day on friday last week um it ended up closing off of its highs but um well well off of its highs but it was up pretty strongly on the dovish ppi news and i was a little concerned uh you know i outlined it in my newsletter i was a little concerned that despite that dovish ppi equities didn't respond nearly as favorably I also talked about the dollar appearing to have been in the process of continuing its reversal off oversold lows. Um, so, uh, and, and I, I actually wasn't even considering what was going to be happening in bonds uh, because uh, the PPI news to me suggested that, uh, that the yield should have been coming off because bonds would be bid on uh, the weak PPI. Uh, and actually, it's really interesting to look at the cross asset. Uh, price action that was taking place because you know uh so we didn't have uh 
we didn't have the the market like the bond market open this week but if you go on the week bonds uh, the 10 year was the yield went up 18 and a half basis points um, which is you know it's not the hugest rise but I mean if you look at the rise this week compared to a number of the weeks from 2023 and 2022 and all that I mean it's a, it's a pretty good size rise it was off it was down from uh, this week from where it had been uh, at one point of the week but um, you know it closed a little bit down today but still uh, you know it's a pretty good strong move right um, despite the fact that the PPI data was dovish and one of the things that happened was uh, the uh, one of the things that happened was that uh, this week at Davos um, overseas you had uh, a lot of rhetoric from central bankers uh, around the globe talking much more hawkishly uh, and I think that put a, a little bit of a bid into um, or you know, led to a little bit of a sell-off in bonds uh, but what else was interesting with these, was the action in the dollar um, the dollar was also up this week dollar was up uh, 0.8 uh, so about 78 basis points and that was interesting considering the equity price action to end the week if you look at on the weekly chart here you can see the huge wick to the downside so you know my video from last week was prescient in that it the first two real trading days or the you know two and a half trading days if you include Sunday um, that price action was uh, was pretty bearish uh, and then, of course, in the last two days, if I go back to my daily chart, in the last two days, we, uh, I mean, you kind of saw it on Wednesday. What happened was we were down over 200, uh, well, not over 200, I'm sorry. We were down like 50 points on the NASDAQ, I'm sorry, on the S&P here, um, and then ended up retracing about half the move, uh, which to me was really interesting, and I'll talk, I could talk about that as well. Um, and then... We got a huge move up, 40 point move up in the S&P yesterday, and then almost 60 points up today. Um, so uh, the first half was prescient from my video, and then the second half actually uh, fit more of what my newsletter suspected, which was uh, that honestly, there's a lot of things that could potentially allow this trend uh, to continue. So I'm thinking about a lot of different things, uh, but I want to go to, I'm going to go to a one minute S&P chart just for a moment so that I can go back to yesterday's price action. Uh, so uh, yesterday, <clears throat> excuse me, so yesterday we were down uh, from Wednesday, uh, and, and, and again, even looking at Wednesday, uh, we had gotten down pretty low, 47.46 was uh, where we were at on the lows of uh, Wednesday evening or Wednesday afternoon. Um, and then we got, uh, or yeah, Wednesday late morning, I guess we'll say. Uh, and then, of course, it really roared back before the close. Uh, and it's pretty wild. We're almost 100 points higher than we were at the lows uh, on Wednesday. Um, but obviously we came up. Uh, and then it was interesting because the price action on Thursday, uh, in my opinion, it was acting like that little bounce back that it was getting was going to sell off. Uh, and then what was really interesting was the, that we had a tips auction at about 1 p.m., between 1 p.m. and 1.30 p.m. Eastern time on Thursday. And basically the market hasn't looked back ever since then. Um, and what was really interesting was, uh, was on looking at it on the NASDAQ, I'll show you what it looked like on the NASDAQ, uh, it was essentially a V bottom, right? So... The auction was around 10-ish. The reports about the auction were about 10:30, and it was basically a straight line up, right? And then you know you had you have like Brent at Spot Gamma was talking about the massive call buying that was happening in the Nasdaq during uh, you know basically from two o'clock until uh, until you know 2:30, um, and that which was pretty ex extensive, uh, rec just record-breaking like numbers for that day. And then, you know, we kind of went sideways. And then what was really interesting was just kind of like went up since then. And then, of course, today we kind of dipped back a little bit and then just like a rocket off. Um, so, yeah, it was I think there was a lot about that uh, that tips auction that, you know, changed uh, some of the perception going into uh, the last two trading days of the week, which is to me is interesting because the tips is, you know, inflation protected. 
Um, so it's not like it was like some average bond that was getting bid, um, but it was, uh, it's the inflation protected bond. Um, so why would, it's almost like why would people put a bid into that um, if they weren't a little bit concerned about the inflation? Of course, the other thing, you know, if you, you can go back and look Thursday morning before uh, market opened, you had, I, I believe it was Bank of America came out with a, uh, an, an upgrade to Apple stock, uh, and Apple was up 3.26% on that. Um, you know, and it's, it's just, it's, it's just a, a total clown show, honestly. Um, and I'm not saying this as a bull or as a bear, but like, you know, if you actually go, uh, I think I posted it on my Twitter. I, I can actually see if I can find this, uh, really quick. I don't know. Um, if I don't find it soon enough, I might just, uh, leave it. Oh, here it is. Uh, I posted this on Twitter. It was really interesting because it showed yesterday the upgrade from Bank of America Securities from neutral to buy, and it changed the price target from 208 to 225. And what was interesting about that was eight days earlier, we got a downgrade from buy to neutral, uh, and the price target didn't change, but it was downgrade. And then on the 4th, we got a downgrade as well that also had a price target decline. So if you actually look, the decline on the 4th, 200 to... Uh, from 220 to 205, we basically flipped the script on that in a matter of what? What is that? Uh, 15 days, 16 days? Uh, no, uh, 14 days. I'm sorry. So uh, it's just kind of a it's just kind of a joke, honestly. Uh, how like analysts do like price targets and things like that. So you can see um, Apple had a pretty significant price drop ahead of uh, January 4th's. Um, uh, downgrade, right, which then it fell another, you know, over 1% from that. But a lot of the selling damage had already been done even up to that point. So from the closing high uh, to the end of the close, uh, or to the close the day before Apple's downgrade, it already dropped 7%. So in the grand scheme of things, adding another percent wasn't that big of a deal. And then, of course, the upgrade, now, you know, everything is, is back on as, as it relates to uh, at least uh, Apple and tech. So it's just kind of interesting how that happens. Uh, but in any case, um, so that definitely, the, the tips auction to me, as well as Apple's upgrade, really kind of like juiced the market. Um, and then of course we had OPEX today, which is the largest single stock OPEX of the year, uh, typically. Um, and, uh, and so there was some discussion about pinning and things like that when um, and there's a lot of people that are uh, forecasting declines after this week, but it is really interesting to note the breakout that we have, at least according to the previous highs. Um, and uh, what would be really interesting now is to see if any of these trend lines come into place. So what I did was uh, I went from basically the uh, one of the lows um, from last or from October 2022. Uh, and drew a line connecting it to the low from October 2023, so basically a year apart, um, and then found that if you clone that line, uh, then you not only get the September uh, 2022 little pop, um, but then you also connect it to the highs from July of 2023 and the highs that we just put in in December. Uh, and it's a, it seems like a pretty good channel. And then all of these other faint lines that are in, in the, in the uh, channel here uh, are trend lines that are support or resistance at times. Um, so we actually have a pretty defined, uh, pretty well-defined price channel here. Uh, and I might even go so far as to suggest that it's possible that we, I mean, it looks like on today's price action, we were trying to, uh, we were trying to close above uh, you know, and the settlement price was below, but the non-settled price was uh, was above. It's kind of interesting, but as you can see, what I just did was I cloned uh, I cloned the trend line up a little bit higher, and this is kind of what I'm watching for right now. Is uh, if I clone that trend line, you can see we collect the uh, May 2020 uh, May 2022 and the August 2022 uh, spikes. Um, tops, uh, and that means that we have a, a pretty considerable amount of space between where we're at and the top of that. So from our close today, you know, we're looking at another three to four percent of a move, and that's that was if it that's if it would have happened in you know a day. Uh, you know, if it takes 
some time for this to unfold. We could see 4%, 5%, uh, something like that uh, higher in the S&P uh, for this channel to still really work. Um, it looks like this is the market structure right now. I'm not really sure. I'm going to make this line uh, faint uh, like some of my other lines um, for now. Uh, but that's something I am going to be uh, to be watching over the next couple of weeks to see if that plays out. For now, the way that I read this is this is resistance until it's broken and proven as support. So we've got a couple of different ways on the S&P that you can look at this. Um, you could make the case that this breakout uh, from the red horizontal trend line, which is the previous high, uh, needs to be retested. Uh, and so the question is, what's going to happen? You know, when and if price ever comes back to this level to test, is it going to hold or is it not? Uh, Probably what would be pretty painful for traders would be if this pop ended up getting sold off and if it came back down below, that would actually be a bad sign. Uh, another thing, uh, or so, so one thing that could happen is we could get this to come back and then retest and resume or break down. So that's a possibility. The other thing that I would be watching to see is if we end up getting above, oh, this, I gotta move this. Uh, if we end up getting above the, the, rising trend line retest that and resume the trend like this uh, so that's also a possibility and i would actually wonder if just given where things are at if this isn't actually the most likely uh, option and i'm just uh, you know i'm approaching that from a technical standpoint not necessarily uh, a fundamental positioning or flows standpoint so um so i would uh, i would i would say that i would I would say that the, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, we've moved up so far so fast. Uh, but honestly, none of that really matters. I mean, like think about coming off the COVID lows, how fast we got back up to our previous high, you know, six months later, less than six months later, and then how we made a 100% gain from that retrace within one year from the, from the lows. Uh, and then we extended it even beyond that. I mean, just essentially a straight line, you know. And of course, this this was happening during monetary easing, interest rates at zero, right? And the thing now is, despite the fact that stocks have moved up so high, I mean, what do you think is going to happen if we get easing and cuts like the market is is predicting? Uh, if, if that in fact does happen, what's to say that things can't just continue to go up? Uh, that's that was basically the story of prices from the March lows of 2020 all the way up to the peak. So uh, anything is possible. And just because prices have gone up doesn't mean that they must come down. Uh, so you have to be really careful when you think about when you people throw around the word valuation, um, you know, and uh, really, honestly, valuations in the eye of the beholder. I mean, a lot of people thought valuations were too high back in July. You know, so are they any better now? Uh, what's really changed? at this point. So uh, so just consider that. Um, NASDAQ obviously very strong. Tech is, is, uh, tech is really in charge. Uh, and what was really interesting that I want to, let me see if I can do this uh, really quickly. Uh, let's see, I'll go compare and I'll do uh, ES. So what I want to do here is I want to show you on a one minute chart something that I saw uh, yesterday. So I'm actually going to need to redo this real quick. Uh, so I'm the, the NASDAQ is in the white uh, and the um, S&P is, uh, is in the orange. And one of the things that I thought was interesting uh, was how um, uh, in our price action, it was actually on Wednesday. Uh, and I, I wondered what was going to happen in this case. So Again, if you just follow the white line first, that's the NASDAQ. So we came down uh, really low in the price action. And at 7 a.m. or 10 a.m. Eastern time, I actually tweeted that, you know, usually what happens is on these big sell-off days, somewhere between 6.45 and 7 a.m. is when those things bottom and then they just grind higher. And that's literally what happened. But what, was, what I want to point out is notice on the white line, the higher high put in by the NASDAQ. And then the orange, the S&P, uh, we had the same kind of sell down and then bounced. And then we actually went lower. 
And so while a lot of people were watching the S&P saying, oh, wow, we're making lower lows, this thing is going to waterfall down, I noticed this divergence uh, between the price action on the S&P and on the NASDAQ. And I actually wondered if that was a sign that things weren't, in fact, going to uh, improve. And all that is to say that, you know, in the, the way that the markets are right now, uh, it's hard to see a situation where NASDAQ doesn't outperform to the upside. So whenever you see those kinds of divergences and you see the NASDAQ outperforming and, or changing direction, um, it's entirely likely that the rest of the market will follow. And, you know, just the last two days as evidence, in both cases, the Russell was down like a percent or almost a percent on both days, uh, the last couple of days, uh, the last two days. And I mean, half a percent yesterday, uh, down about a half a percent today, actually. And the Russell ended up following the NASDAQ and the S&P up higher. Uh, so I um, just want to point that out. So honestly, uh, markets look pretty strong, even, even if you want to throw you know, an RSI up here. Uh, we're getting close to overbought, but like think about how long we were at or above this level, like basically from November, mid-November all the way uh, to like the end of December before we started to get some relief on that front. Uh, and the same thing on the NASDAQ, although we did get a little bit more of a dip in uh, the beginning of December. But uh, I mean, NASDAQ is overbought right now, but it, it's not to say that it can't stay overbought for, for longer and, or at least that it might go sideways. Uh, so this will be interesting to watch going into next week. Um, you know, technicals on equities, they, uh, other than that little NASDAQ overbought uh, RSI, uh, the technicals actually appear set up in such a way that if this breakout can confirm on the red trend line or if we can break above the ascending white trend line here, then it looks like price will be pretty bullish. Um, there is a risk that this could be a false breakout. Uh, but there's a couple other things that kind of like affect the way that I see this situation. Uh, one of those things is that the uh, sentiment survey on Wednesday came out uh, much more bearish. Uh, and I, I shouldn't say bear it wasn't bearish. It was still there were still more bulls than bears. You can actually see the bull bear spread here. Um, but it came off pretty significantly. Bulls uh, percentile ranking went from 86 to 63. Uh, 85 bull bear spread to 64 uh, bearishness kind of came up uh, still below 50 but but you know just you know pretty substantial increase in bearishness and then the neutral increase was really big so the uncertainty and bearishness is actually probably more of a positive sign uh, for equities than anything else um, and then the other thing that I want to point out and I don't know I, I'm gonna have to put this up this way I apologize uh, but uh, some po my positioning indices, uh, which I show on my newsletter. What's really interesting is uh, if you look on the equities section up here. Let me actually zoom it in a little bit more so it's easier to see. Uh, on this uh, this equity section right here, um, you know what you actually see from it uh, is that like what what you would want to see if the positioning was getting was was exceptionally crowded. Uh, then what you would want to see is zeros in the commercials. Uh, for S&P, NASDAQ, Russell, or Dow, um, and then hundreds in the large or small speculators. And while, you know, especially uh, the NASDAQ and Russell, while those numbers are really high in the speculator column and under 10 in the commercial column, the, the one thing that I would point out is that, you know, for the last two weeks, these were giving zero readings uh, on the commercial side. Uh, and on the large and small speculator side, we were getting some you know, some hundreds uh, in some of those columns. So all that is to say is like the positioning got less long over the last uh, over the last week. Um, and the sentiment came off and got got less bullish. And so I think that there is a possibility uh, that far too many people are expecting this to reverse to turn around or people think that it's gone too far too fast and that this there that just might be fuel for uh you know for further takeoff uh some other things i want to check in on uh breadth so if you look at the stocks above the 50-day moving average we look at this a lot uh obviously we had a couple of uh a couple of weeks where we were elevated 
between 85 and 90 and actually on a couple of occasions closed above 90. We have given that all back or given a lot of it back. So we're now at 7395. Um, and so this actually reminds me quite a bit of uh, actually after the March, uh, uh, the February and March COVID crash. So we actually came up and we got uh, well above the uh, 90 level. And then as we came off, uh, there was some corrective price action in the S&P, uh, but it didn't go lower from there. Like it didn't crash down and go a lot lower. Uh, so there's that uh, dynamic. And then there's also the 2019 dynamic, uh, which if you recall, uh, the stock market had gone down 20% in Q4 2018 um, and then just rose from there uh, after the, the first Powell pivot. And you can actually see price came uh, or the stocks above their 50 day moving average came up above the 90 level and then was kind of coming off. But then stocks still continued to uh, to melt up from there. Uh, so we've got a couple of different um, places on this. Like and again, on the on the top side. This is not always a great indicator. It's, it's a much better indicator for bottoms uh, than it is for tops. So, you know, whenever this thing hits the, the 10 level, then you can pretty much just hold your nose and buy. And it's pretty high, like, I mean, it's an 80% hit rate or something like 83% hit rate, right? That percentage is not as great when the stocks above their 50 day moving average goes to the 90 level. Um, so whenever you see this, you have to incorporate a positioning analysis or uh, a technical analysis, or you have to include m multiple other things to get a good read using this. For now, what I would say is that the breadth indicator has come off both on the stocks above 50 and stocks above 200 in such a way that it's actually supportive of price actually continuing to the upside. Um, so I do want to uh, highlight that. Um, as well. Uh, and then the other thing I just wanted to mention here, a ratio that I often will look at is the high beta to low beta ratio. And I like to use my tide indicator on this. Um, and something that often will happen is price likes to come back towards the colorful line, the tide line. And the high beta low beta ratio, uh, what you notice actually when you look at it is when it goes into a bearish tide or when the trend is down generally, you can pretty much count on the stock market to underperform or to correct, which it essentially did from the time that the tide crossed in January 2022 uh, until it kind of bottomed out and started going sideways, right? So, uh, and then of course, the beginning of, uh, in January 2023, we got the bullish tide cross. And basically ever since then, we've just been in an uptrend. And uh, you know what asset prices have done since then. So. Um, Price, th this, uh, this ratio coming back to the tide line is actually a really good healthy sign for the market. So um, on the flip side, I, I would be wondering, you know, if, you know, what's going to happen with the dollar and what's going to happen with the treasury bond yield. So um, here's, here's one thing I would look at bef and we'll wrap up here talking about the dollar and the yield. Um, so if you've watched this channel before, you know that when I talk about my tide indicator, uh, that one of the things I will say is when the tide is bullish, then the price or the level coming back below the uh, control line, which is this faded line, uh, is usually a statistically good spot to start looking for uh, a resumption of whatever the prevailing tide trend is. Um, so obviously the market like it, nothing is 100 percent foolproof so just because it just because right here on the dxy it was bullish tied and then price came back below doesn't mean that it has to go back up so nothing is certain it, we're talking about probabilities here so you can actually see this is a really good example in bearish tide every time price came up above the control line it sold off came up sold off came up sold off right uh, and then if you want to go back in, on the dollar to the bull market, right, uh, you know, ever since the bullish tide happened, comes back, takes off, comes back, takes off, right? So it's a pretty good sign. And in this case, the tide is bearish and price came up and, and intraday traded multiple times above 
the control line. So what I'm wondering is, is this about to resume to the downside? Now positioning suggests that the short dollar trade is actually getting a little crowded. Uh, but then there are also other currency trades that seem to be giving mixed signals. So this is a there's a lot of uncertainty for me around the dollar trade here. You can actually see the tied line is turning green, which means that the underlying tide momentum is actually turning more bullish, despite the fact that the tide itself is bearish. So a lot will depend on the direction the dollar takes. So if the dollar goes, the dollar could go back down and the tide indicator suggests that the greatest probability is that it will indeed go down, but it could go back up. And if it goes back up, then I suspect risk assets uh, will be under some pressure. So I want to say that there. Uh, and then the other thing that I want to talk about on yields, and we'll close with this, is I brought this up. I, I can't remember if it was last week. I think it was last week. Uh, but we got we were going to get a bearish tide cross. I think we did confirm last week the bearish tide cross. Um, and what I was uh, emphasizing was that I would need to see the tide cross actually pr like lead to a much stronger downtrend uh, before I actually believe it. And the reason why is because we've had uh, just since in the last two years, or actually the last three years, we've had two instances where bullish tide turned to bearish tide, and that lasted for less than a few weeks in, in each occasion. So this first occasion, uh, we have, uh, let's see, one, two, three, like almost a month that passed uh, of kind of sideways action before bullish tide took back over. Uh, and that was in 2021, I think. Yeah, 2021. And then in 2022, or I'm sorry, in 2023, we got a bearish tide for about a week, two weeks. Yeah, two weeks. And then we got back to bullish tide. And just what I'm seeing here is we've got a bearish tide cross, but price is trending back to the upside and we did this is like classic behavior right here so you see the tide cross that's what the red flag stands for we traded intraday above but then we actually closed down so that's interesting so there is i have some just like with the dollar i'm uncertain about the direction that yields appear to be moving based on my indicators because it's bearish tide the probability ought to be more to the downside however the last couple of times, like I said, we got that bearish tide cross, it didn't really mean anything. Uh, and the most sensitive, or the, the time where the tide cross is the least certain, as far as like predicting uh, the probability of future price action, um, is when you have just had a fresh cross. So like in all of these situations, the problem was always that the tide crossed as price was converging towards the tide and control line. And the same thing happened back here. Tide's coming down, but price is converging back up towards it. And so that makes me wonder, are we going to see three times in a row now that the bearish tide cross ends up being a false cross and leads back to a bullish tide cross? And if it does, then that would mean that there's room for the longer term trend to continue to the upside and that would also to me be dangerous for risk assets so uh, I want to close with that if you want to see more insights and get more uh, of my thoughts and my process then you can subscribe to my newsletter like I said the link is in the description of the video below um, I hope you guys have a great weekend and I'll see you guys next week